is how hungry. I'm so thirsty. I'm feeling afflicted. Greetings, hero. It is I, your friendly neighborhood rabbi, here today to talk to you about the particular restrictions on our behavior on Yom Kippur. And this list is a doozy. But before we get into that doozy, if you're just joining us here in the fall, or if you're just seeing one of my videos for the first time, you should know that this is part of a 31-day fall Jewish holiday challenge in which I've created 31 videos to teach you all sorts of different aspects about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and all the celebrations leading up to them and in between. If you want to sign up for that sort of thing, click on the first link in the show notes below. You'll get a downloadable guide to the holidays for the rest of the year, plus links to all 31 of these videos, specifically designed to help you have the most informed experience of the fall holidays. And when you know what's going on, it's easier to have an experience of meaning and joy. Plus, if you sign up before the end of August, there might be a prize for you. Maybe, I don't know. But back to the topic of hand, which I dread, and that is the five ways in which we afflict our souls on Yom Kippur. As I said in the previous video, the Torah isn't super clear on exactly what we're supposed to do or not do on Yom Kippur. It just says that it's supposed to be a day of complete rest in which we afflict our souls to atone for our errors between us and God in the prior year. And that means that it was left to the oral tradition from God to Moses at Sinai on to the rabbis of future generations, which are now technically past generations, to discuss what does it mean to afflict one's soul. And they said, you know, you can't like take out your soul and afflict it. So the best way to put us in that atony frame of mind is to deny ourselves of bodily comforts. The chief and most obvious of which is eating and drinking. So the number one thing that we do to afflict our souls on Yom Kippur is no food and no water, and no Pepsi. Nothing against the Pepsi people, no tab either. No eating or drinking for the entirety of Yom Kippur. That means from shortly before sundown on Erev Yom Kippur until after sundown on the next night. This is approximately a 25 hour fast. And I know there are many people who can hang with the no food thing, but the water thing is tough. Not gonna lie to you. However, there are millions of Jews who do this around the world every single year and don't die because of it. And I think, not for nothing, many religious traditions have a fasting component because I think that arc of experience from intensely feeling those bodily cravings to gradually feeling like you can let go of them creates this kind of feeling of spiritual uh, acuity that makes you more open to introspection and more open to a spiritual experience. And not just because of acute dehydration and hypoglycemia. Although it can't hurt. So that's the number one thing. No eating and drinking for 24 hours. In the next video, we'll talk about what to do if that would put you in serious medical jeopardy. The number two thing we don't do on Yom Kippur is no wearing leather soled shoes. That seems oddly specific. In Jewish law, it frames this as na'alayim sandal or wearing leather sandals. Back when they came up with this rule, having leather sandals was considered the height of comfort, especially when all streets were cobblestone streets uh, at best. And so if wearing leather soled shoes gives you comfort in the world, don't do that on Yom Kippur. Of course, over the last few hundred years, that tradition has extended to leather shoes at all. Some people even refrain from wearing leather anywhere on their person, like belts, watch straps, you name it. The original purpose of this was to separate oneself from bodily comfort. However, many people find great meaning on this day where we are atoning to also separate ourselves from what they see as the animal cruelty involved in the leather industry. That on this day we are imitating higher beings and we don't need for an animal to die in order for our feet to not be sore and our pants to stay up and our watch to stay on, which we're constantly checking to see when we can eat. Maybe that's just me. So in general, avoid wearing leather that makes you more comfortable, especially leather soled shoes. The funny thing is you can see people who you normally see super dressed up wearing sneakers on one day a year. The third thing you refrain from on Yom Kippur is bathing or washing. Again, this comes from a time and place where daily bathing wasn't normal and bathing more frequently than one absolutely had to was considered a luxurious behavior. And just as we're separating ourselves from the luxury of eating and the luxury of wearing leather, we're also separating ourselves from the luxury of bathing. Important caveat, if and when you use the bathroom on Yom Kippur, it's okay to wash your hands for hygienic reasons. Likewise, if you have a cold that day, especially if you're like me and your kids just started going back to school, which means you're sick and you're coughing or you're blowing your nose and you, you wash your hands for that, but only just as much as necessary. Don't be like there half an hour, 
Oh, I'm washing my hands. This feels so good. Maybe I'll splash some into my mouth. Oops, I accidentally uh, drank a bunch of water. Yeah, don't do that. So it's okay to do the minimum amount of washing so that you don't make yourself or somebody else sick, but be quick about it and don't use it as an opportunity for bodily luxury. The fourth thing you avoid on Yom Kippur is uh, anointing. I do, I've never anointed in my life. Why am I gonna stop now? This comes from a time and place where it was a luxury to anoint oneself with fragrant oils as like a hair treatment or a form of deodorant. In general on Yom Kippur today, we avoid putting on perfume and uh, fragrant lotions and things like that. Because again, this is a bodily pleasure. This is a, this smell is like a feast for the senses. If you're not feasting on food, don't be feasting with your nose. That sounds weird. No nose feasts. But John, I can't bathe and I can't put on deodorant. Tell you what, wear clean clothes. Keep your arms down like this. Nobody like, hallelujah. Woo! Remember, it's just one day a year. Everybody's in the same boat as you. And as long as you're apologizing for stuff, you can always apologize for pit stank. And number five, the final thing that we refrain from on Yom Kippur is, how do I put this? No marital relations, no sex. And that applies to everybody. Don't get cute and be like, well, what if I do with somebody I'm not married to? Once again, this is considered one of the primary needs of the body. And as I've said elsewhere, the rabbis in the Torah are not anti-sex, not by any means. Just like they're not anti-food. That would be a skinny old religion. But on this one day of the year where we're supposed to focus on our souls and our relationship with God, this is one of those bodily pleasures that we are to dispense with so as not to distract us from the important work of Yom Kippur. You can do it before, you can do it after, not during. You can go 25 hours. I've gone a lot longer than that. And as one of my teachers says, if you're not bathing and you're not putting on deodorant, this last one's an easy one. Besides, you can't be coming on to somebody with that hunger breath. You know what I'm talking about. Hunger breath is real, y'all. As long as you're saying sorry for stuff, say it like this if you have to. I'm so sorry for that thing that I did and for my stanky hunger breath. And people will be like, that's okay, me too. So those are the five things that you should avoid on Yom Kippur so that you can focus on the important work of atonement, no eating or drinking, no wearing leather-soled shoes, no bathing, no anointing in fragrant oils and lotions, and no getting biz with your spouse, partner, or anyone else. And remember, all this stuff isn't just because God wants to be mean and punish us. This is the Jewish interpretation of what it means to afflict one's soul or isolate it from bodily comforts so that you can focus on the important work of Yom Kippur. As I said before, this is many people's favorite holiday, oddly enough, because with this intense focus comes a heightened awareness, comes more in-depth introspection, and can actually free you to have a more spiritual, meaningful, and even joyful experience on Yom Kippur. That's all for this video. Thank you so much for learning this stuff with me. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. On the next video, I'll give you my personal tips for how to fast for Yom Kippur, and when it's not only acceptable, but commanded, to not fast. If you want to know so much more about the fall Jewish holidays, make sure you're signed up for the challenge by clicking on the link in the show notes below or selecting that handy dandy orange square over there so that you can get your downloadable guide to all the major Jewish holidays throughout the year. Links to 31 lessons besides this one so that you can get the most out of the holidays, have the greatest experience of meaning, joy, growth, connected with the Jewish community. Until then, hero, peace.